Everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, I'll be talking about uh, a few of the fold recovery systems and some other stuff uh, before I get into the mid-air retrieval, which I did for six years for both the air launch cruise missile, uh, the NASA drones for aeronautical and structural testing drone, and um, some work uh, to improve some of the winches that we use in the mid-air retrieval. Starting out, uh, we get the slides. Am I get the slides? Am I supposed to hit this down here? Yeah. There we go. Okay. We'll get into this in the last part of the uh, of the debriefing. We'll start out here uh, picking people, uh, things up off the ground, started with the mail pickups in the late 30s. Uh, then uh, they started picking up uh, gliders, C-47s. The center item here is the uh, manual, a uh, survival manual. Uh, you put these poles up and a line between them and they'll come off and pick you up. And up here is an actual pickup of a person. They started out with a sheep when they first did that before they let a person do it. Now, I've not been able to find a lot of successful pickups other than practices. However, in 1952, there was an operative in China, a uh, CIA fellow, and uh, they went in with the C-47 to do this type of pickup here. Uh, unfortunately, the guy that they were supposed to pick up was captured. The pilots uh, were killed when they got shot down, and the CIA agents uh, spent 20 years in Chinese prisons. So, uh, hate to start with that story, but that's when you've got into these types of things, that's what uh, can end up with. Now, we move on to uh, the Fulton Recovery System. The first uh, Pickup was done um, in 1958 in a Marine, did it in a uh, Navy Neptune. But then again in uh, 1960, well, wait a minute, I gotta tell you this a pig was used on the first ones here. And uh, when they picked the pig up, he got into a big spin, he got into the aircraft, they got him in there fine. Uh, but he was disoriented. <laughs> when he finally got his senses back, he attacked the crew. So, sh should, should use a sheep when you're doing these things. But in 1962, uh, they dropped uh, two CIA fellows out of a B-17 uh, into uh, a I always have to look what that's called. It's called a drift station. It's a Soviet drift station. It's actually facilities that are out on an ice floe. And the uh, Russians had abandoned this, and they spent 72 hours on the ground there gathering up all the stuff that was left there by the Russians. And they got a lot of information about submarines uh, around the, under the ice and everything else. And here you get their medicinal, medicinal scotch here is after they got picked up. Now, many of you may have been familiar with that because this airplane here, same one they used, was used in, in uh, Thunderball to pick up uh, 007. So they did find another use for it. Later on, uh, SARS, which is a full recovery system that was upgraded uh, somewhat. And uh, they would put up the balloon, they would fly along and they would catch it here, and pick the people up and pull them into the aircraft. Uh, this uh, was used uh, once, only one record I can find in Vietnam. And again, they dropped the package, there's a whole package that's got all this equipment in it. Uh, unfortunately, North Vietnamese got the package and not the guys, so uh, pretty much they left uh, 
the rescues in uh, up to the helicopter pilots. I think we had smaller crews or something in the 130s. So that was the end. No, then, and um, they did rescue a, a individual well behind uh, enemy lines uh, uh, during um, the desert storm. Saved his life. The English also operated uh, the STARS type uh, aircraft and they made some pickups. But uh, somebody may be using it again, but uh, they stopped in 1996. So if anybody's using it, it's probably the CIA and they never tell us what's going on anyway. So. Okay, well, here's how it works. It took me a while to figure this out. But uh, you saw in the other one where they caught it on the nose and the, the line went back to the aircraft and then these guys back here use a hook to pull uh, it up to the airplane. The pilot, or whoever they picked up, is way down here someplace. Then they fasten another uh, uh, clamp on it. Once they've hooked that clamp on, then they release it from the nose, and then they use a winch to bring the individual into the aircraft. Uh, out of 17 years, they did have one fatality, and as near as I can figure, they didn't try to make any practice pickups live after that point, but they did operate till 96, and he did uh, have some pickups uh, at that time. McGuire rig, uh, I, uh, well, a year or so ago, somebody asked about McGuire rigs. Uh, yes, Jerry would know all about these, if I can catch up with my slides. Uh, these are basically ways to get uh, people off the ground where there is no place to land. So they drop down ropes that have been looped you have McGuire rigs and stables. They're both the, do similar things. They hook up quite slightly different. But they're dropped about 100 feet. Then they have to raise the people up, clear of obstacles, whatever it happens to be, uh, probably trees and other things. And then they have to fly them to where they can put them back on the ground. And they can then land and, uh, and pick them up. The Air Force uh, didn't, I'm not sure about our Green Hornets that were over in Vietnam, they may have used those, but uh, here in the States we didn't have that in the mid-1970s, they had some snowmobilers, uh, mobiler, snowmobile guys uh, that were uh, trapped in deep snow up in Montana, and then they actually fixed ropes up, looped and went down and lifted those guys out into a safe, safe area. And we called it the rope trick. Uh, you know, we didn't have these fancy names. Starting with mid-air retrieval, uh, this all started uh, with spy satellites. They were making photographs of, uh, in space, and uh, they wanted those packages when they came back to be retrieved. So, uh, Mid-air retrieval started with the fixed-wing aircraft, uh, C-119s here. Uh, they had, I think, 14 failures, not necessarily of the mid-air retrieval, but just to get these things in and out of uh, satellites and back down to the ground. So doing that, they finally successfully did that and started the mid-air retrieval. These were done uh, under the, called the Falling Star out of Hawaii. And uh, that's because when the satellites came back, they uh, would streak through the sky. So they did that from uh, uh, September of 61 and then did it uh, on later. They replaced the 119s with the 130s still doing the same mission. The uh, commander out there said that uh, the C C-119s were two-engine aircraft in a four-engine uh, ocean. And so they quickly uh, 
change them out for the 130s. They also had the helicopters. They started out with the H-21s, the H-3s, and then the 53s, and these were only to make surface pickups. They weren't doing any midair retrieval. If the 130s missed them, then these guys went after the package. Uh, the uh, H-53s were call sign was Soki. We were in the Utah desert, and we were also part of Systems Command, so our call sign was Soki. I never quite figured that out, but that was, uh, that's the way it went. They finally decided that helicopters could do it. Uh, any H-43 pilots here? Okay. Not the favorite helicopter in the Air Force, but uh, a uh, very substantial machine to do things, and they did the first mid-air retrievals of the helicopter uh, with the uh, H-43, proving the concept for helicopters. This is how the whole thing happens. Your vehicle buzzes along, the drogue chute comes out, the main chute is then pulled out with an engagement chute up here, goes into full uh, parachute. The helicopter comes along with poles and uh, uh, hooks on the back here, catches it, and the main chute falls away, and they fly away. Almost always does the main chute fall away. Uh, I fortunately never had anything like that happen to me, but. Uh, Jerry Tan, who you I think you'll see in the next uh, slide, he had one that the, didn't separate. The thing is, it's going to separate because these are 10,000 pound uh, stress on the load lines and something will fail, which in his case it failed very early and uh, it didn't have a problem. You have a guillotine that you can cut the cable with if you're fast enough. The biggest problem is that the helicopter tends to pitch over if you're trying to do this. And the big emergency procedure there is not to do anything because if you pull back quickly, the blades will flap down. You can actually damage your tail. Uh, so it's one you kind of hold and wait and kind of 1,001, 1,002 and hope it separates. Fortunately, I was prepared, I think, if that ever happened to me, but fortunately it did, never did. Okay, there's 390 feet of cable on the, in the winch that's on here that makes the catch. The winch holds the package to about a 1 to 1.2 G so that everything uh, uh, reels out so that, uh, so you can end it up with uh, 150 feet of cable out and there's 380 feet on a lot of these parachutes, so you have uh, something flying under you, basically, at over 500 feet. And if it didn't get quite right, it may be another 100 or 150 feet below you. Uh, when it does stop, then you reel it in, and um, everything uh, is fine, and you head home looking like this. But in between, you're looking, you're looking like this, and it's quite a waste bump underneath you. The other thing is that you break off if uh, you haven't caught it at 100, at 1,000 feet above uh, ground level. You don't, uh, you you break it, break off your approach, simply because you're descending at uh, 12 to 1,600 feet somewhere in there. Now, if you've got something 500 feet below you, it's possible to hit the ground. Has happened. Didn't happen to me, but it has happened to people I know. Okay, the early helicopters, uh, White Sands was catching things, or had things coming in from space, and they needed to have catches, and so, um, I flipped a, one too many pages. Looking at the wrong place, sorry. Okay, here we go. Here's the winch, 390 feet of cable. 
Here's uh, the pole hook. The pole hook and the flying hook. This flies in between the two poles. It's, it's loose. As you see, it's got three tongs on it. Any one hook can make a catch. Pilots like to get all three hooks in there. The back enders, they want just that uh, uh, pole hook in there because they're going to wrap that parachute around that winch, which they have to pad and everything else. If they can get rid of a couple of those hooks, it makes it much easier to reel that aircraft uh, in. Every one of my guys had a, a uh, buck knife because once the cable gets in, if you have problems with the package, the only way you can get rid of it is with a knife. If you put a buck knife next to a uh, load line carrying 1,000 or 2,000 pounds below you, it will separate immediately. So knives always were carried so they didn't have the blade down. It has happened. Not to me, but uh, <laughs> okay. Back to the early helicopters. Uh, this is a beast that has two reciprocal engines uh, in the pods out there. It was the largest helicopter at the time, and it was uh, catching up to 2,500 pounds. And the winch and everything. Uh, this picture doesn't have the poles, but it had the same kind of poles uh, that you saw on the. Uh, other aircraft and what we've just shown. I'll try to change before I talk about it. Okay. In Vietnam, 130s carried the RPVs. They were reconnaissance uh, drones. They also uh, flew leaflets and they also were sent into high uh, hostile areas to seek see where all the guns were actually. Out of 1,000, they lost 544. Two-thirds two of those were to hostile fire, the rest of them mechanical. And uh, one and uh, some were lost over China and ended up in the museums up there. The remarkable thing is that there were 2655 successful Mars in, in Vietnam by the uh, H3s out of uh, 2745. And that's 97%. And that is a, a, a very good number because it isn't necessarily that they missed it. It could be all kinds of some stuff, parachute problems, uh, the drone not getting to the right place, everything else. So. Uh, they're catching these RPVs and then they're taking them back and the camera film is taken and uh, surveys what, uh, what they flew over. What they didn't fly over was Sante. And uh, they had tried uh, at least a time or two to get something over there. But uh, toward the end when the, the drones had, the RPVs had uh, turned away, didn't get over Sante to recognize what was there. They didn't want to send any more over for fear of letting uh, the Vietnamese know what, the, what was happening. So nobody knew that the prisoners were not there until the force landed uh, to, uh, to try to get the prisoners out, and they'd already been moved. Uh, my first combat mission was with Herb Kalin. Herb flew an H-3 into the compound intentionally because with the explosive ordnance people, they had to blast a hole in the wall to get the rest of the special forces people in. And it was manned, even though the prisoners weren't there, the, it was manned. Uh, they successfully crashed leaving an H3 there, uh, and everybody got out, and nobody got injured, and unfortunately, nobody came home at that time. But the, the word is that uh, they moved most of the prisoners up to Hanoi at that time, and they had a lot more interface between 
the uh, folks and the prisoners. The Israelis also were flying uh, RPVs. Uh, they were flying low-level reconnaissance. Uh, they used it in the Yom Kippur War and some other battles. A uh, Syrian MiG-21 crashed trying to shoot down one of the drones. So they uh, also uh, drones were used, or RPVs were used to um, for target for fighter pilot uh, training down at uh, Tyndall for many years, and these uh, drones uh, could act like airplanes. They could fly as low as uh, 10 feet down over the water, or they could uh, uh, fly up to I think 20,000 feet or something like that. So they didn't shoot them down, but they were able to chase them with their camera films and other things to do training. Okay, this is my world. H-53, uh, specially uh, modified, door and ramp were removed. A winch was installed in an opening in the floor, which had required structural change. Forward-looking camera, there's another aft up there and there someplace. Poles extend down 12 feet. Are, yeah, they're 24 feet long, and they sit down about 12 feet below the aircraft. And uh, they're 13 feet wide. Only three H-53s were modified to do this mission. Later, um, it was cut down to two because training command needed one, and we sent them to them. Long after I retired, it went down to one. Uh, flight planning is very important when you're carrying passengers out to over 9,000 feet, which is what they did, and they didn't do proper flight planning. Uh, they didn't do a proper approach. They landed hard. The blades came down and cut, down, cut off the top of the cockpit. Fortunately for the pilots, they were thrown forward and they didn't get hit when the blades cut off the top of the cockpit. Now the engine controls are up here in the top of the cockpit. <laughs> They're no longer there. So they evacuated. They're watching the helicopter, it's still running. It's leaking fuel. And after about 15 minutes, one of the best signal fires ever would occur and uh, the aircraft was totally destroyed. A very sad situation, but all the passengers got out, nobody was injured, but we lost a, a special type of aircraft. Types of chutes. Um, these are the chutes that we normally practice with. They're different than the one you're going to see later for the Alcom. You've got the engagement chute way up here. It's 225 feet above the a main chute, which is 100 feet wide, and then the package is down 155 feet. Problem with this chute, that engagement chute can be anywhere around the parachute. In fact, you turn final, it's on the left side. It's spinning around what we call coning. It can be on the end, so you're having to adjust all the way uh, down final to make sure that you can get to that parachute. Now, a gliding chute has a little shorter load line, but it also has these panels in here which allows it to actually be moving forward, dragging the, the engagement chute behind it. Makes it much easier to target and uh, much easier to catch. Okay, the main mission that we had was supporting the test and later SAC training of the air launch cruise missile. It would be launched from B-52s all over the place, uh, from out over the Pacific, uh, I think from the East Coast, and uh, we were at the Utah Test and Training Range. The missile would uh, 
most of the time appear there and uh, in the early training. Later on it appeared there almost every time, but uh, in the early days. But then it's uh, picked up by the F-4s and uh, chased by the F-4s and it does fly on the deck uh, most of the time, uh, climbing over mountains and other things. We got to uh, use something else besides uh, our Soki call sign here. We were called SWEAT in these particular missions. Okay, the process, the missiles cl flown many miles, 1,000 miles or more, arrives in the test and training range. We're holding it around 12,000 feet, which is above the oxygen level. We had a waiver to be above 10,000 feet for no more than 30 minutes. It hit its simulated target and then turns to about 30 miles to go to our location where we're going to catch it. We watch for the F-4s, because the F-4s, if anybody has been around them, they have a lot of smoke out the back. You can see those. So that's what we're looking for, because we can't see that alkum. It zooms to around 18,000 feet. The parachute deploys. And then the chute descends at about 16 to 1,800 foot a minute which means if we don't get to it in about eight minutes, it's going to hit the ground. So 4,000 foot uh, surface out there to, in the Utah range. So that gives you possibly two passes. So we are pretty close to the recovery area. We know where it's going to be. And remember, we have to break off at 1,000 feet. Now, what happens if it's not caught? We had... Uh, our story was we caught every one of them, which we did. But there were some factors in there because sometimes they never got to the point where we could catch them. I've spent time on the ground picking up pieces uh, in the early days. So, but we did have uh, some situations where there were parachutes and we didn't catch them. The first one was probably the worst uh, the parachute didn't deploy till it got down to around 5,000 feet or so, which was way below where the guys uh, were waiting to catch it. It ends up on the ground with about a 20 knot wind, and it goes sailing across the uh, Utah desert. Now, he had a security policeman, I think he's a civilian, but uh, he sees that and he's going to do so. He, he's, drives down the road with his pickup truck, gets in a line with it. The smart thing he did was get out of his truck. The parachute comes, hits the truck, kind of bounces over it. The missile at around 2,000 pounds hits the truck, spins it, keeps on going. The bad part of this, I wasn't there, and I don't know what I'd have done because what uh, the crew did was land a helicopter in front of it. The flight engineers got out with their buck knives and uh, tried to cut down the uh, shroud lines. They cut some of them, got back in the helicopter, proceeded in front of it again and cut it down. And they did get it knocked down after it had gone about 10 miles or something. That's a no-no. We weren't supposed to do that. Uh, they took their life in their, literally their life in their hands to do that because if they stumbled over the sagebrush, it would uh, not have been good. Okay, the other thing, and I was unfortunately on this one, uh, had a young captain on his first mission that after he was qualified to go after an Alcom, and I was flying as his co-pilot. Uh, everything's going fine. And we uh, hit the engagement chute, nothing, no catch. Turn around, get going around, hit it again. Everybody thinks everything looks good, not. So embarrassingly, we have to go down and pick it up and uh, sling it back. When they did the investigation on it, they found that the engagement chute was mounted backwards. Then the load bearing members were on the back side of it. We kept tearing out the front of the chute and never never got a catch. Uh, the other one, uh, another one that I was on, uh, 
it hit its target. It's heading down south. We're looking for the uh, F force. Can't see them. Can't figure out where they are. Now I'm worried because it's below us. It's going to zoom up by us. We hear it's going into zoom. We hear that the chute is out. We can't see it. Finally see it uh, several miles west of us. We scoot over there as fast as we can with these poles bouncing up uh, behind us because we're going 90 knots or something like that. And we get there, so we're going to make one pass, take a look. The engagement chute was sitting in down inside this uh, the main chute. So I told the back enders, keep the cameras on. We want to make sure we have a record that when we got here, this is the way this thing looked. The, le oh, and the, reason, the reason that we couldn't find it is that the uh, planners forgot to put in magnetic variation in their last 30 miles. And uh, so it, that had nothing to do with the condition of the chute, but that's why it was so far off uh, course. And then the last one was bad weather came in, and they were having to fly it around looking for a hole to zoom it through, which they finally did. Uh, Jerry, who you saw in that other thing, had one airplane, I had another. We climbed up through the hole, following this thing up there, trying to get as high as we can, when suddenly it comes streaming down. The parachute never uh, was a streamer. So it, it went sailing past us. Uh, for Fortunately, we didn't get uh, hit, but, it, but that was, uh, that's where it ended up. So those are the four that we didn't catch. The rest of them, we caught them. This, uh, this is how it's supposed to go. Parachute comes out, gets some good chute. We fly along uh, at it. This side shows that the, lo uh, the load line is on the back side. And this is the moment of catch. And then... The main chute falls away. Here's the missile. Here's the engagement chute. Good catch. And uh, we're on our way. Now, why is this parachute different? Than, uh, this is different than the other parachutes that I showed you. And the reason is the uh, parachute is uh, maintained in the weapons bay of the missile, which is very small. So they had to design this special chute in order to fit into that package. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the reason that's such a peculiar chute. OK, up close and personal, uh, we give a call 30 seconds and then 10 seconds. This lets the back enders not only know that we're coming, but to get the cameras on. We fly through the. Uh, main chute there, the engagement chute goes under the helicopter. Uh, the back enders say contact, and the pilot pulls in power because you're trying to sink the, the hooks and then to level off. Main chute's away, stable chute, uh, and uh, they're pulling it up and into the uh, position which will take it home. Know where the drogue chute is. It's in the wrong place. <laughs> it's hanging up on the load line. Um, they had just changed where we were docking this thing. It was 90 miles away. We could only make 55 knots. Normally with this, we'd be able to go 90 or 100 uh, as long as it stayed stable. But it got so unstable, we couldn't get above 55 knots. We had the photo ship there, Huey. He finally figured out that he couldn't keep up uh, or that take that long a time to get up that 90 miles. He was going to run out of gas, so he had to, he had to leave us. So we had plenty of gas. It was a slow trip, though. Drones for aeronautical and structural testing. Uh, when you work with NASA, at least my experience, they're outstanding people, and they treat you like you're one of their team. There's nothing uh, that goes. OK, there's the drone. It's, this is the same aircraft that uh, uh, they flew all the X aircraft off of. And if you look close, you can see all the 
signs on there where they've painted every single thing that they've launched off of there. And they flew it. There's the way the drogue chute's supposed to look. They had a tremendously, must have been expensive pad. It was inflated. They told us specifically exactly where they wanted the nose of this thing and where the wings were supposed to be. And we lowered it onto there. And then they pulled the plug on it. And it slowly sank down into solid ground so that they could recover it. And this, what, uh, this is what a DAST looks like. It's a AQM-34 drone, supersonic, but the wings and everything were modified for all the testing that they were doing uh, with it. OK, it goes into recovery, starts dumping gas. Here's the engagement chute. This one was an a, a abort. It only flew about 20 minutes for a three-hour mission. So there's a lot of gas on it, but it's all dumping it, so it all ends up at the same uh, weight. We know what the weight's going to be. This particular one, uh, the load line is supposed to come down to the top here and then down. It didn't. It came straight down to the vehicle. So we had to make sure that it was not wrapped around anything. But it's a gliding chute, so it kept everything good. As we come along, we catch it. Uh, NASA is very happy, and we fly it back and put it on their fancy pad. OK, then uh, next time we go down. No, OK, the first time, the first time I went down, I did not fly. I was in the control room. Uh, the Joe Nastasi, young captain here, uh, was uh, the pilot out there. And uh, the way it uh, was handled, they, did, they flew it in a big racetrack. And the helicopter was to orbit in the middle of that racetrack. They lost control of it out at the furthest distance from where the helicopter was. And they actually were signing that aircraft off. But Joe got himself going as fast as he could, uh, got out to where it was. He caught it. And uh, NASA's extremely happy. Uh, Joe never did tell anybody at what altitude that he actually was when he caught this thing. So we feel he was probably below the 1,000 foot. Fortunately, that has a shorter load line. So um, NASA's very happy. A few weeks later, I get a call from NASA and says, when's your commander's call? I said, you know, we got one in you know, a week or so. He said, well, we'd like to come out and present uh, Captain Nastasi with an air medal. I said, well, uh, that's good, but uh, he's at Norton going through safety school. I said, oh, at Norton. He said, OK, when did your commander call? I told him. He said, OK, uh, get a hold of him and time to come up to Edwards uh, that morning. So he came up there. They put him in an F-104 flew him from Edwards to Hill Air Force Base. We awarded him the Air Medal. <laughs> Got back in a 104, flew back to Edwards, and back to safety school. So NASA treats you good. Uh, also, the next time down, uh, they had just launched the B-52. They'd launched uh, all their chase airplanes and everything. And I was getting ready to take off, and I had a hydraulic leak. And I called him and said, you know, this is Soki. I have a hydraulic leak. Uh, Roger Soki, uh, keep us informed. Very relaxed, no, you know, no panic. Uh, they've already spent thousands of dollars just to launch. And my young uh, airman that I had with him was a hydraulics guy. We carried those around in H-53s. And he had all the parts and everything and had it fixed in about 20 minutes. And so we were able to get out there ready for the launch. Unfortunately, the B-52 uh, was in Iran. That's inspect, repair, and it's necessary and not the country. And they had a DC-130 there. They got everything ready to go. We're in position. They said they called for the launch. And then I'm hearing recovery, recovery. I'm looking around, because I'm down around 10,000. They're about 20,000. 
I'm looking for a parachute. I cannot find it. And so suddenly I look down and there's a big column of smoke down there. When it came off the wing, all electrical power shut off. They couldn't, they couldn't recover it, uh, so it went down. So I spent the rest of the day, which was pretty high winds as a matter of fact, uh, ferrying the uh, inspection teams back and forth out to the crash site. We did uh, catch other shoots. Uh, this was just a, a personnel shoot. It's uh, used to fly without hooks for training. So you just did figure eights back and forth when you're first, first getting used to flying close to parachutes. This shoot uh, has a 45 foot diameter and you catch the whole thing. It's worth about, uh, can weigh, uh, things can weigh up to about 600 pounds. The first time I flew and saw that, I was in the back. And Jerry, that you saw earlier, was uh, flying. He caught it right at the very top. It turned into a parasail and would fly up toward the tail rotor and fall back down, go up, back down. Um, as you can see, we, we took a long time and very careful to uh, reel that in, so we got it reeled in. So later on, uh, we're doing some winch testing, and the winch people, uh, all American engineering who has been involved in most every one of these mid-air retrieval uh, events, said, uh, you know, our, we can catch from 250 to 4,000 pounds, and, uh, but we don't have any record of anything for 250. So we put together some lead weights, put them on this chute here, dropped it out of a 130, went and caught it. I made sure I was low on it so I didn't do this. And I said, okay, guys, uh, uh, let's go dock this. They said, let's go home. I said, what do you mean? I said, we got to get rid of this. They said, we already pulled it up through the hole. We, you know, we got the, everything on board. We're heading home. So we did. Okay, I can't tell you much about these things except these are very small and catch very small packages. They don't have winches. And the other problem, uh, uh, they're, they're new. And uh, obviously, for, these are real photographs, so they're, they're out there really doing it. This is a drawing up there. But uh, here's the next thing that's supposed to happen. I talked to Lockheed, uh, tried to talk to Lockheed, tried to talk to Boeing, who are a part of this program. They're looking at catching up to 25 thousand pounds. Now how they're going to do that, they're either going to use uh, big 53s or Chinooks. There's several, several ways they plan to do that, but this is, it's primarily like this. The drogue chute will come out here and you have the parasail sailing along. You have this thing here, which they're going to pull up and then it closes and traps on there. I can't believe they can reel anything in. Uh, I tried to find, that's what I was trying to find out. Uh, but I guess and they'll just bring it back like it shows here in this illustration, and drop it from, or lower it down from a high altitude. So this is the next thing. You can go to the internet, you can find all kinds of information on it. Some of it's back for 2004, some of it's fairly new. But they are still planning to do the mid-air retrieval uh, with these engines. They think that uh, they can do it much cheaper than SpaceX, who is landing their engines uh, back on uh, barges, and they can turn them around much faster. So this is, uh, this is the, the new thing. And uh, one other item, before Jerry and I got out, somebody came and talked to us about doing this very thing with our conventional way, catching 9,000 pounds. We were both close to retirement. We said, hmm, that may be a good paying job when we get done, but we never heard any more about it. But it's still, still in the works. And this is SpaceX, and they just take theirs off and come back and land on a barge. They don't mess with the helicopters or anything else. Ground-loss cruise missiles uh, are 
out of the inventory since the 90s now, but uh, did work with them. We would pick them up. They had a bigger chute. They had a 100-foot chute. They had a ground release. Uh, so we never caught them. All we did was go sling them back. But uh, they were kind of neat. Of course, the Tomahawks are still flying. The Navy's uh, sea-launched uh, aircraft are out there. This is my last operational mission, and it did involve the Glickham. They were flying it along and went into the clouds. If they can't keep sight of it, they have to put it into recovery. They put it into recovery and took them days to find it. Now, notice all this flat land out here? It landed up here in this little, little valley. So, uh, among the trees. So we went in, lowered the, the uh, winch down, picked it up, pulled it out, and they had a flatbed truck. Uh, so this was my last operational mission. I did some training missions. I did some other mid-air retrieval after that for currency and things like that. But that was, uh, that was my last operational mission. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. That's why uh, all the, there's uh, components in there that would be damaged by a hard landing. Now, I'm not sure how much they did on the, on the Glickums, uh, so that was, uh, that was a little, uh, they, they landed, they surface landed all the time anyway, and unfortunately that time they, land, they landed in a, an awkward spot. Okay, uh, you will hear somebody say, we're going to get it next time. That was from that mission where the parachute was mounted, the engagement chute was mounted backwards. But this is about a six minute film, which will pretty much end my uh, briefing here. So uh, we're ready to go. Thank you. An ace and a king. A good hit and a good catch in time of war and in time of peace. All in this chapter of Air Force Now. off from Griffiths Air Force Base, New York. The aging strata fortress, well into its third decade of operational service, serves as the major strategic delivery vehicle for one of the Air Force's newest defensive weapons, the air-launched cruise missile. SAC and Systems Command are jointly testing the missile on a regular basis to ensure its continued reliability after periods of storage. After launch from the B-52, Fighter aircraft from Edwards Air Force Base, California, intercept and escort the missile as it speeds toward its target. At the Hill Air Force Base, Utah test and training range, it will be caught in mid-air by personnel of the 65 14th Test Squadron. Captain Lyle Koenig. The purpose of the mid-air retrieval squadron here at Hill is strictly cost-effectiveness. If a helicopter air crew can successfully mid-air retrieve a cruise missile, saving it from a ground impact. Systems Command can again use that air launch cruise missile in a series of tests. Only two HH-53Cs in the Air Force are modified to do the mid-air retrieval mission, and both are required for each air launched cruise missile test. Top-notch maintenance is essential to ensure the aircraft are ready. The training we receive here at Hill differs a little bit from basic helicopter flying in that you have to get over the initial apprehension of flying the aircraft uh, close to a descending parachute system. The Alcom's terrain contour matching guidance system helps it maintain its planned course to target. As it nears its target, 
the retrieval crew launches to rendezvous with it. Before starting engines checklist. Flight stations. Check pilot. Check co-pilot. Checked engineer. Center console is checked. Overhead control panel is checked. Heaps are closed. Starting engine checklist complete. Hill ground. Sweat 72. Starting engines. VFR. Sweat 72 engines. Start approved. Now, perimeter 3005103086. Advise and ready to taxi. Sweat 72. Another team from the 6514th is preparing a giant bean bag. Soft docking will be performed to prevent damage to the Alcom's sensitive components. Okay. Callie hold the missile, two o'clock. There she goes to the zoom. Roger. Bring her around to right a little bit. Coming right. Okay, right off your nose. You should have it now. Callie Hill, I got it. Okay. Looks like we have a good system. Mid-air retrieval is a team effort. At times, the pilot can't see the chute system. So the back enders become his eyes. Okay, engineer, I'm starting to lose the system. Start talking me through it. Okay, got it back at five o'clock, slightly above horizon. Continue on out. Okay, got a little bit of a clockwise rotation. Bring it around to the right. Okay, coming right. 30 seconds, we're just going to down just a little bit. Okay. We're getting it this time. Oh, no, fine. Plenty of time. It looks good. Airspeed's good. Stable shoot. Mineral retrieval is simply, uh, Flying the aircraft at 55 knots indicated airspeed, very close to about a 100-foot chute system, putting it between 12 and 13 feet below the cockpit of the helicopter so the mid-air retrieval apparatus can successfully grab the parachute. Coming through. Contact. Got the system. Got it in the rear. challenge. It's a rewarding feeling to make a good catch, and I wouldn't trade this assignment right now for any other assignment in Europe. A $1.1 million vehicle that moments earlier had been speeding over the desert floor will now fly again, thanks to mid-air retrieval. Now we can cut this. Yeah, where are we going? Cut that one. That goes on for another 10 minutes. Made that catch too. Okay, the summary. Uh, Mid-air retrieval has been a practical method for 50 years. Apparently it's going on with this new uh, parrot foil systems and everything. And uh, the RPVs have been replaced by satellites uh, that did a good job to do all that in Vietnam. And the parafoils are being developed. And the MAR recovery of reusable rocket up to I don't know how many pounds. So that's still under, under uh, study. Other than that, I'm, uh, any questions? Oh, 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 uh, Ron, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but you were in such a little bitty airplane. That's. Well, I know, but we still have, our slowest speed with gear and flaps pull out and stuff. We're 65, you're going 55, and we're trying to keep up. <laughs> I'm sorry, now. The question was, what was the diameter of the cables you were using? I'm still missing a word. Diameter of the cables? Yeah, okay, the cable is 390 feet long. Uh -huh. there, the, the load lines are 380 on the big chutes. 
it's only basically 55 on the alkyl shoot, and they're about 10,000 uh, tensile strength on all of them, and they're not very big. Those things will hold up to 10,000 pounds stress. Any other questions? Well, thanks, Rich. Great presentation. Thank you.